Jersey, Ms. Andrews is a graduate of both Rutgers University and Howard University School of Law. Natasha began her legal career in securities and labor law, wanting to connect her labor experience to her strong media background. She fine tuned her focus to legal media development and marketing, where she served as an instrumental legal PR specialist in Silicon Valley. The child of immigrants, Natasha shifted her focus to assisting international performers seeking legal entry, work, and status in the U.S. Natasha is multilingual, speaking French, Spanish, Creole, and English. She has found a home in bridging her loves of international practice and media entertainment by representing the immigration and management needs of international arts. In addition, Natasha has a proven record of success with counseling, developing, and negotiating on behalf of domestic entertainment clients. She brings over 16 years of representing artists and entertainment entertainers in film, television, theater, social media, influence, music, and sports. I want her, I want you guys to welcome Natasha to the room. I want you guys to tap your mic. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And Natasha, I want you to kind of kind of just give us an overview of how you ended up um, working in the cannabis industry, what led you to it, and why, you know, it's so important to you. Thank you, Anika. So I know a lot of my background talks about my immigration and entertainment, um, and not a whole lot about my cannabis. My pursuit of cannabis law actually started as an offshoot of having so many immigration clients. Believe it or not, I had more than you can imagine um, worth of clients who were detained and later banned from the U.S. as a result of low-level, nonviolent cannabis um, offenses, arrests. Those kinds of things become part of your permanent record, and it led me to kind of investigate, like, this is stopping so many people from either coming here into the U.S. or being able to stay here into the U.S. You know, and a lot of times it be these really heartbreaking stories. Fast forward, um, during my investigation, I got clued into a lot of the social inequities and a lot of the injustice between the people who were making the money and the people who were sitting in jail. Needless to say, as a Howard law grad and someone who is vested in social justice, that kind of took me on a whole tirade to uncover what was going on in the cannabis space. And I realized, wow, we've been lied to for a really long time. <laughs> so it became my new passion and, and my uh, new focus. Um, that's really what brought me into cannabis, and it led me to launch a cannabis consulting firm back in 2018, back before it was really popular and sexy and in, in darn near 37 states. I started working with smaller businesses to get them into this cannabis space, realizing how much money was to be made and realizing who was not making that money. It became absolutely imperative for me that I reach out to those people who were being left out and make sure that they had a seat at the table. So you guys met Natasha at the top of the hour. She is Natasha Andrews Esquire, AKA Cannaboss. And she is not only a fabulous, talented, multilingual attorney, she is also my friend. And I feel so blessed that she is here today with us to walk us through everything, contracts and agreements and what you need to know. So Natasha, let's just jump right into it. Is that all right? All right. Um, thank you for that, Lanika. And Lanika, as she said, we have been friends for a long time. I'm very, very glad to be here and to be a part of this in this regard. Hi. Um, as I was saying, I'm, I am going to give a quick disclaimer because I would not be an attorney if I didn't, right? So the information I'm going to give you is basic and generic information in the sense that you guys are all over the country, all over the globe, really, on fan base. And so just keep in mind that as I give you these uh, pieces of information and these nuggets of wisdom, I will try to stick to the things that are generic in terms of U.S. law, but not state specific. You may wind up having some state specific questions or want more information. And we can always you can always DM me. Um, my subscribers have access to me to get to certain information, but I will try to make that readily available to you. With that said, um, again, I uh, my, my company is Evergreen Solutions, and when I'm not helping people get into the cannabis game, I do a lot of legal work, among which and at the foundation of which is contracts work. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of different types of contracts, but I want to go over the basic understanding of contracts. We get into them all the time, every day. You probably get into 
one to five contracts in any given week. Um, whether it is uh, you're renting a car or you're purchasing a home or even you're, you're downloading an app that requires you to sign off an agreement, you, you run into contracts all the time. And sometimes people don't even realize that they are engaged in contracts, yeah. but I'm going to explain what they are, what they are not, what they're designed to do. And I'm going to give you some direction with regards to making contracts with your clients, um, how to read contracts for yourself when you're the recipient of a contract. And then we'll talk about a specific type of contract, which actually forms a type of corporation, which is called a partnership agreement. Um, we'll go through those three general elements and I'll kick it off with contracts, uh, what they are or why we contract. Essentially a contract is simply an agreement. It is an agreement between two individuals or to entities or a combination of individuals and entities. So say for instance, I could contract with Lanika um, as two individuals, Lanika's company Trash, Trash Logic could contract with me or Trash Logic and Evergreen Solutions could contract with one another. In addition, some people don't realize this, but contracts don't always have to be written. They can be verbal or oral. You can actually get into a contract with someone just because you've come to an agreement over something via conversation. One second, Natasha. I just realized when you said that, that I never introduced myself, you guys. I'm Lenika Johnson. <laughs> I am the CEO of Trash Logic. <laughs> we are a national trash management waste logistics company based out of California. We service four markets growing every day. We started in 2016. Um, and grew very fast. And so I returned uh, to school when I realized that I was just a business owner and not a CEO. And I went back to UCLA Anderson to learn how to be a CEO. And once I learned that, I decided that I needed to teach other solopreneurs and other entrepreneurs that were trying to build companies and not just small businesses. And that is how CEO School was born. So back to, because she was like, oh, and you know, me and Trash Logic, I'm like, oh, they don't know what Trash Logic is. That is what Trash Logic is. That is my company. So back to your regularly scheduled program. Go. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. I got to not take for granted that everyone knows Lanika how I know Lanika, but yes. So you can have two companies that contract with each other. Um, but as I was saying, contracts don't have to be written. Now, the thing about contracts to keep in mind is there is a difference between what a contract is or you entering into a contract and whether a contract is in fact enforceable. I don't wanna make it too complicated, but you could actually get into a contract. You could have an agreement with someone and then find out on the back end that it isn't enforceable or it isn't enforceable the way you thought it was enforceable. So the tips that I'm gonna give you now are going to help you to make sure you not only have contracts or agreements, but that they are valid, that they are legal, that they are binding, and most importantly, that they are enforceable. At the end of the day, most people who are uncomfortable with getting into contracts fall into two categories. Either they are people who don't understand what a contract is, and so they are a little overwhelmed by the weight of signing this document and you know, what am I getting myself into? What will I owe if this contract is breached? I don't understand some of the legalisms in the contract. So there's that category. And then there are the people who quite frankly have something to hide. Those are kind of the two groups of people who aren't too fond of contracts because at the end of the day, a contract is the best way to protect you. You the individual or you the corporation, you want to be getting in contracts. You want those contracts to be binding. You want them to be enforceable. You want them to be legal and you wanna be able to have something to refer back to, right? Cause contracts are usually not for the here and now. Contracts are really for some time in the future. Some time when memories fade, you don't quite remember what you said you would do under certain circumstances. You don't quite remember whose job it was to do X, Y, or Z. That's why you want to have a contract because you want to be able to go back and say, okay, this is what we agreed to. With that said, the simplest definition for a contract is an agreement, a formalized agreement. As a matter of fact, some contracts will say contract at the top of them. Some will say agreement. Some will say memorandum of understanding, or they may say um, scope of work can sometimes be a contract, or they may say resolution. Those are all different terms, but at the end of the day, they mean you and I agreed on the following terms. And further, we agreed to exchange the following things. 
And we agreed that if A happened, then B would happen. It just memorializes everything you agree with or agreed upon, which is why I said there is no reason to be afraid of contracts. You want to have them because it, it gives you that support. Okay. So <clears throat> there are some elements that go into a valid contract because, as I mentioned before, you can have a contract that is not valid. There are five elements that are generally agreed upon. And I'm sure if you Googled it, you would find some people that said five, some people that said eight, some people that said 10. The reason for that is there are some standard things that you need to have in order to even have a contract. And then there are some highly recommended things. And we'll talk about those templates that Lanika mentioned a little later on, why they're helpful and how they're helpful, but also why they can be a detriment, right? So the five elements that you wanna be aware of in terms of contracting are generally going to be offer, acceptance, consideration, jurisdiction, and uh, legality, right? Those are gonna be your five elements. And I'll explain what- Let me repeat those for them. Sure. Um, you said offer, acceptance, consideration, jurisdiction, and what was the last one? Legality. Legality. Now you guys know when you come to CEO school, you should have a pen and paper. If you're not driving, you should have a pen and paper. <laughs> so make sure you're writing these things down. Now th remember, CEO school is always full of information that you're not gonna just readily get without either doing a whole lot of research or paying somebody a lot of money to get. So you wanna have pen and paper for it. Um, so the five elements of an agreement are offer, acceptance, consideration, jurisdiction, and legality. And I'm gonna put a pin in it real quick. Um, when you think of an offer, essentially that's what you're giving up, right? That's what you're, I mean, it says it in the name, it's what I'm offering. So I can offer to clean your car, right? Or detail your vehicle. That's what I'm bringing to the table. Um, and what you're going to do in exchange, which would essentially be your end of the bargain, will often be referred to as that consideration element. So I'm offering to clean, to detail your vehicle in exchange for you paying me a certain amount of money, $50. You pay me $50, I uh, clean your vehicle. But you need more elements than that. That in and of itself doesn't create a contract. I can't go to a court and, and say, well, I told her I would clean her car, for $50 and she didn't give me $50 because I haven't even addressed the fact as to whether you've accepted it. I've made an offer, but you're not required to accept that offer, right? So in order for this contract to be viable, you've got to accept my offer. And within the contract, I can write out how that acceptance has to look, right? And if you accept it, if you do the actions that I've lined up in this contract, then you've accepted or a court could interpret that as you've accepted. And then we're, we're that much closer to having a contract. So I've offered to, to detail your car for $50. You've decided, yeah, that's a pretty good deal. I, I'd like my car detailed. So you accept my offer. And I've said the way you're going to accept it is you're going to sign off on this document that we're, we're writing up together. Um, the consideration is the actual exchange that occurs. So my actually washing your car and you actually paying me the $50 would be that consideration. That element has to be present too. Otherwise you don't have a contract. I can't just tell you what I wish for and you tell me what you hope for. And, and then we say we have a contract that way. Okay, I have a question about that because I've been in this situation before <clears throat> where I have had um, a potential client that, I that we entered into a contract and for whatever reason, uh, they pull out right before the contract starts. So say we're supposed to start April 1st, and today they decide that it's not in their budget and they don't wanna move forward, or their previous provider has um, matched my, my uh, proposal. And so they're gonna stay with their, their, their previous provider, or whoever they already had. So at that point, do we not have a contract because that exchange has not happened yet? That's not necessarily the case. So when I talked about the enforceability of a contract, that goes to, so you can have the agreement, right? Okay. But then it, it boils down to, can you make that person uphold their end of the bargain? And if you have all of the other elements that make it a contract, if you truly have a valid contract, 
you absolutely have the right to pursue that person and have them either complete their end of the bargain or pay you a certain amount equivalent to what you would lose if they pulled out. That gets into a whole other aspect that deals with breach and something called detrimental reliance that you don't have to write down unless you plan to go to law school. (laughs) That gets us a little bit into the weeds and that does talk specifically to the idea of why you need an attorney when you're doing business and you're getting into contracts. Okay, so my question is when you're so when you were talking about consideration, can you go into that a little bit more then? What is so give me an example of what that would look like? Sure. The consideration so the, the consideration in and of itself, like you, the five elements that I described can't be separated. You know what okay. I mean? Like you can't pull out that consideration part and say, well, that didn't actually occur, the exchange didn't occur, therefore the contract is invalid. Okay. What, what essentially it is, is that those five elements are required to have a valid contract, but most contract disputes arise because someone has not held up their end of one of those five elements. Ah. They haven't paid their consideration or there is an issue as to the legality of what you're getting into, or there's an issue as to the offer. You know, when one of those five elements is challenged, that's usually when you wind up in court, right? And of course, like anything else, (laughs) dealing with civil law, and this deals with civil matters, which are different than criminal matters. Those are the the two kinds of things that wind up in court. Um, When it comes to things of civil law, what it boils down to is, is it worth pursuing? That's a whole other question, because a lot of times people have a legitimate right to pursue a claim, but they either don't have the time or they don't have the money or it's just not worth it, and they will choose not to but that doesn't negate the fact that the contract itself is in fact valid. So in the example that you gave, if you had a customer or client who backed out of a contract that was a legal valid binding contract, you could go to the court and that would be your grounds for your lawsuit. They breached the contract and by breach, it means broken. They've broken this contract because we had offer, we had acceptance, there was consideration and they are not fulfilling their part of the um, consideration. As a result of that, Your Honor, I want you to either force them to go through with the contract and and enforce some sort of injunction to stop them from contracting with someone else, or I want to be paid or compensated what would be called detrimental reliance because I relied on them. I did my whole budget for next month based on the reliance that these people were going to follow through on their end of the bargain, and they didn't. So those are what are called remedies. Those are things you would ask the court for if it ever got to that point. Okay, like, remedies. Okay. Yeah, those are remedies. Whenever you actually, whenever it gets to the point where you've got to go to court, you're looking at remedies. You're looking at cause of action, meaning why are you here? Why are you asking the court to, to intervene? And remedies, meaning this is what I want from the court. This is what I want from, from the opposing side. Make sense? Yes, yes. This is such good stuff. Okay. So to continue where we left off, we covered offer, acceptance, consideration. Um, Legality is an interesting one. People don't realize you have to contract on something legal. I cannot contract to sell you crack. No matter how much crack I have and how much you're willing to pay me for said crack, that's (laughs) not legal. (laughs) Because it's not legal, I cannot, I can write up a contract, but no court will enforce it, which makes what I do for a living very interesting because what I do for a living is not federally recognized as legal. So this is an area that I have to deal with often in how to craft contracts when you're dealing with an area law that is recognized in a state as legal, but not recognized federally as legal. But you have to make sure that what you're contracting for is legal. You cannot contract to put it out on your ex. You cannot contract to rob a store. You have to have a legal premise. That said, the person who uh, enters the contract with you has to also be competent, right? I can't contract with a three-year-old. No matter how much I want them to put their pajamas on and go to bed, I cannot draft a contract or get into an oral contract and then try to enforce this in the court, right? Because they're three. Um, By the same token, I couldn't contract with someone who had mental delay, you know, detriments to the point that a court recognizes that they're incapable of making uh, legal decisions for themselves. I couldn't contract with someone who was under the spells of dementia and so on and so forth. So yes. part of legality deals with whether the person is competent to contract with you. 
jurisdiction is that last piece. Um, jurisdiction comes into place because there are you, there are sometimes some uh, options and choices as to which law you follow. As you are probably well aware, if you do operate in multiple states, there are different rules in those different states, right? So I could be living in New Jersey, but I could be contracting with someone who's in New York. I have a decision to make if I'm the one drafting the contract. Do I want that contract to be based on the laws of New Jersey or do I want it to be based on the laws of New York? Well, it's not so simple as saying, well, I'm in Jersey, so I'm gonna go with Jersey. I actually need to know which laws are gonna be more favorable to me, right? Because I'm the one drafting this contract. So I've got to look at it and say, hmm, I'm in real estate. This is a real estate transaction and the laws in New Jersey are more favorable than the laws in New York for me as the, the property owner. So I'm going to want the jurisdiction to be New Jersey and I have the right to put that in the contract. Remember though, you as a person receiving the contract have the right to negotiate any element of the contract. Even when someone tells you your contract is non-negotiable, you still have the right to negotiate. And as a matter of fact, you should negotiate. If there is a point in a contract that you do not agree with, you should be negotiating that point. You should at least have that conversation come out on the table. Because what you don't want to do is enter into a contract that you feel pressured into entering, because that may not come into a, to play in a court. And remember, contracts are not for today. They're for some point in the future. They're for the point where there is a dispute. Most people don't enter into a contract in dispute with one another. Most people enter into a contract when everything is great. There is no fallout. There is no disagreement. We both remember what we said because we were both there. It was 10 minutes ago. So we get into that contract and in six months, 12 months, five years, we're like, whoa, stop the presses. This is not what I meant when I said I was going to clean your car. I didn't say you could throw Cheerios and smear <laughs> oatmeal. That's not what I meant. What I meant was if your car was in reasonable condition, then I would clean your car for that $50. If it's not, there are all these extras. So be very um, cognizant of where your jurisdiction is. In addition to um, having the option of have it where I am or where the other party is, sometimes that contract can be in the jurisdiction where the business itself will take place, right? So again, in the same scenario, I'm in New Jersey, I'm contracting with Lanika, who's in New York, but we're contracting about a property that I own in DC. So just be aware that that jurisdiction can sometimes be dependent on your options, right? We can't do our contract based on California law because we're not conducting business in California and neither of us is in California. So there's no avenue for us to kind of grab California, even if California is the most property owner friendly place I could go to. We can't tap into that, but we can tap into any of the three places that are either my location, her location, or the location where business is taking place. There are several things that come under those five headings that I gave you, but those are the basic things that you want to make sure are in your contract. Now I'm going to jump over to um, those uh, online or template for a moment because okay. I know a lot of people use those, right? I, I actually found out that Rocket Lawyer was black owned this week by a certain little birdie. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. <laughs> support that hundred percent. Although I do support it. And I think it's a great starting point, especially with simpler contracts. I wouldn't advise it um, in the same way. I wouldn't advise looking up, you know, uh, a rash and then diagnosing yourself and going and starting to, to try to get over the counter. I'm not over the counter, trying to get prescription medication. That's not going to work. You're not a doctor just because you read something on WebMD. And you're by the same token, you're not a lawyer because you read something on ABVO or you found right. a form on Rocket Lawyer. There is a reason why people in professional business should get a professional attorney to assist them with at least the basics and at least starting out. Now, I'm not saying if you are in the habit of doing the same type of business transaction, that's all you do. All you do is the same kind of business transaction. You don't have to have a, an attorney review every single contract because once you've got that contract set, then you have your own template, right? But remember these templates that you're getting online are generic, much in the same way with the information that I'm giving here. It's generic, it applies they're going to put the stuff in there that's across the board. And sometimes you'll notice they'll ask you what state you're um, operating from. Oftentimes they will ask you that. That goes to the jurisdiction issue. 
but you don't know what you don't know, right? So you're thinking, okay, I've picked one of the states that we're in. I've got that covered because you've given that to me. But you don't know which state is necessarily going to be friendlier to what your objective is, right? Because there's a whole other aspect to the law that you need to understand to really determine what's going to be in your best interest. Now, the other thing about contracts that you have to be aware of is you can't just stack all the cards in your favor and think you're going to have a valid and enforceable contract. Because at the end of the day, a court will always lean towards fairness. They will take what the intention of the parties was, and they will also look at what is a fair outcome, and they will come out somewhere in between, right? Because you're asking a court, if you get to the point where you're doing a contract dispute, you're asking the court to, to meet out justice, right? So if the court sees that you were in a position of power and you stacked everything in your favor and you basically left this person with nothing, they could determine that that uh, contract is what's called unconscionable or it's just, it's, it's just not a good look, right? <laughs> you can't just, it's all about me. I'm going to detail your car for $50,000 a month and all payments have to come in by the first of the month or I get the deed to your house. Yeah, no court's enforcing that because they're going to be like, you're crazy and you exerted way too much power over this person. And, and that person could just come in and just boo-hoo about how they were they were desperate, they had no choice, they were strong. Right. And, and, and that doesn't look good for you, right? So you want to make sure that your contracts are fair, but at the same time that they do seek to cover your best interests. It's a delicate walk and sometimes people are like, well, how do I do both? You can do both. You just want to um, walk the fine line, right? You do not have to disclose everything, right? So think about have it when you go to get a job. But go have ahead. you ever seen? Um, have you ever have you ever seen a um, a contract like that that was just so crazy and so unfair? You know, can you think of a time that you've seen something like that? Um, I actually can. I mean, sometimes people not only when they do it themselves. Sometimes I've seen attorneys who drafted contracts and you're just like, you've got to be kidding. If you think about it, anybody who's ever watched any kind of behind the music <laughs> or <laughs> right. story about artists and entertainers, you know you've heard of things that you're just like, this person was robbed. Right. That down to who had the attorney that was better at arguing. Because um, sometimes we look at those stories and we're like, how did that, you know, how did that side even win? How did the record label win on that? They basically robbed this person. That's because that person didn't have money to buy it, to, to pay for an attorney that could defend them properly in a lot of instances. But, you know, it's, it's not necessarily as black and white as saying who's right and who's wrong. It's really who presents the strongest case. And sometimes that boils down to who's got the most money. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think artists' uh, contracts often show a good example of contracts that can be very one-sided. Um, but that to your question, though, that's a good question, because sometimes you can have a contract that's one sided and that person can still win. That really mm -hmm. does boil down to the argument that's made and who's making it and how. Um, okay. But you still want to err on the side of fairness over greed, because that can backfire on you. Um, and remember, this all also boils down to people enforcing, right? Because to be quite honest, if I have an unfair contract with a client, and that client never pursues the matter and they just continue to pay me, at the end of the day, I got away with having an unfair contract. But I don't believe in conducting business that way because that will come back to bite you. So right. that's a personal <laughs> choice, but I don't recommend it. Um, so again, those are great starting points. They give you a, a good place to jump off and get into the game. And also importantly, understanding those template um, contracts really help you because my profession has a nasty little reputation for charging a whole lot and leaving people confused and uneducated and kind of speaking in legalese so folks don't know what's going on so they can't do for themselves. And I just, again, I don't believe in practicing that way. I'm a big proponent in educating people and having people understand what they're doing. So right. you can sometimes cut down on some of your legal fees if that's a concern by starting out with a template. Because um, I don't know any attorneys that are going to charge you the same amount to draft a contract from scratch as they are going to charge you for reviewing your contract and saying, okay, this is what I would do instead. These are the recommendations that I would make. It's just not going to be the same fee. So if you are concerned about fees when engaging with an attorney, a good place to start is with a template. 
and, you know, use some of the tips that I'm giving you now, jazz up, make it specific to you, and then bring it to an attorney and say, okay, can you take a look at this? This is what I'm trying to achieve. Have right. I done it? Um, so back to the issue of not knowing what you don't know, keep that in mind. It makes a lot of difference. I'm going to give you guys 10 tips before I move on to partnership agreements specifically, because y'all aren't trying to go back to law school or go to law school. I was going to say back to law school. <laughs> y'all aren't trying to go to law school right now, so I don't have to give you every intricacy of, of contracts law. Um, 10 tips for drafting a contract. And I'm going to assume, because we're in CEO school right now, the contracts will usually come from you to a client. That's the focus that we're, we're dealing with here. Um, it's a little bit different when you're receiving a contract. And if we have time at the end, I'll talk about some of the distinctions when you receive a contract. But if you are initiating or drafting the contract, there are going to be 10 tips that I give to all of you. Okay. Number one, get it in writing. Although I said that a contract doesn't have to be in writing, and I stand by that, it doesn't have to be in writing. You can Google it all day long. Contracts do not have to be right in writing, and a court can enforce a contract that's verbal. The problem is courts don't like dealing with verbal contracts because it's too much guessing. It's too much he said, she said, no, I didn't. That's not what I meant, but that's not how she said it. She didn't use that word. No court wants to deal with that, right? That's kind of nightmare. In some instances, they will. But that's, that's the exception, not the rule. So get it in writing. Keep it simple. Um, I can't tell you how many legal documents I have received that are written in legalese, which is the language <laughs> that <laughs> right. is right in, that I don't understand. And I'll share with my colleague, and I'm like, what are they trying to say? You know, why did they go with old English? I yeah. much prefer attorneys who are straightforward, make it easy to write. Because remember how I said that people who don't like contracts are people who don't understand them or people who have something to hide. Right. Personally, I feel that when an attorney uses so much legalese that even other attorneys don't know what they're talking about, there's something in that mess or in that mix that they don't want you to know. So mm. I kind of feel clear of that because it's, it's too complicated. Um, that is something else that a court will look at. A court will look at how convoluted is this contract? Because if it is and you're dealing with a lay person, they'll frown upon that. But um, just keep it simple. The third one is going to be make sure you're dealing with the right person, right? So make sure when we talked about a person's capacity to contract, I talked about mostly mental competency. Um, I talked about contracting with a child or but it's not just that. You've got to make sure you're dealing with the right person, especially if you're dealing with the business. If I'm trying to contract with Costco, I can't walk in there with a contract handed to the cashier and ask her to sign it on behalf of Costco. Yeah, she's a Costco employee, but she doesn't have the authorization to enter into binding contracts on behalf of Costco. So you need to make sure that you're dealing with the right parties. Yeah, use government names. Don't give it to Pookie and them because the court's not going to want to deal with figuring out that Ramon Jackson is pookie in them. So you want to make sure you're dealing with legal entity names, legal party names, and actual true um, people or entities, the right person. Um, that also goes into identifying each party correctly. So not only do you want to deal with the correct person, you also want to identify the party correctly. If it's Costco Inc., then you want to get into that contract with Costco Inc., not the cost. Costco. Yeah. Right. You, you want to make sure you have the full correct name and identify each party correctly. Spell out the details. Do not assume that a court will figure it out or that a person reading this contract at a later date will figure it out because it's not always just about the court, right? You can get into a contract with someone or an entity and then later on down the line, they may assign or turn this contract over to someone else because maybe someone buys the business, right? Maybe someone buys Trash Logic and the contract is still valid because the contract is with Trash Logic, right? But it's not with Lanika anymore because the contract I have is with Trash Logic and Lanika has moved on to her next great mogul um, business that she's building from the ground up. Well, now the new person has to be able to understand what the terms of this contract are and they have to be able to be um, bound to them. But if it's written in such a way that there's just code or things were left out because we discussed it and we never put it on paper, 
that's not going to fly, right? That's where you're going to get your problems. That's where you're going to wind up in court. So you want to make sure to spell every detail out, even if it seems redundant or ridiculous. Put it all down on paper. You, you, nothing uh, bad will come from you putting down what you guys agreed to. You want to specify payment obligations, right? So if I want to make sure I'm paid by the 15th, I need to put in paid by the 15th of each month, not just paid, right? Because they could decide to pay me on the 30th. They might decide to skip a month. They might decide, um, I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today, if you're old enough to know what that reference means. So you want to spell out uh, the specific payment arrangements and details, as well as the penalties, right? So if they don't pay me on the 15th, do I want to enforce the penalty? Is that a penalty going to kick in on the 16th, or does it kick in on the 20th? Spell all of that out. Um, number seven is going to be, to agree on the circumstances that terminate the contract. Because mm -hmm. you do want to have exit strategies that are valid, right? There are a lot of times where you have to get out of a contract. What are the legal ways of getting out of the contract that don't result in a breach, but re result in a separation? If you guys have predetermined that, make sure that it's in there, make sure that it's written out. Um, Agree on a way to resolve disputes. That one's important. I'm sure you all have seen contracts where it says that you agree to arbitration. And again, we don't always read every word of our contracts, but when you agree to that, that means if something happens and you're upset about it, you're not taking them to court. Not only are you not taking them to court, you can't take them to court. If you take them to court and you've signed over that you will go to arbitration, you've actually breached the contract. And even though you may be going after them for their breach of the contract, they can turn around and say, you breached the contract. So this needs to be thrown out of court because we agreed to do arbitration. So be aware of those clauses and what they mean. Um, that's another reason to be careful of templates because a lot of times you don't know what to take out or what's irrelevant or what is not in your best interest. You just are like, okay, this is legal. Yeah, the form may be legal, but it may not be in your best interest for your business and your needs. Nine, you want to uh, pick a governing state law, which we talked about when we talked about jurisdiction. And the last one is not, you don't, you don't find these in all templates, but I tend to put them in for my clients, confidentiality, especially when you're talking about businesses. You may get into a contract with someone that you're doing business with, and um, your fees may be different for this person than they are for someone else, right? And that's not something you want to be out in the open and in the public. You have the right to say, okay, I'll detail your car for 50, but my regular price is 100. So um, that's what I charge is 100. What I don't want you to do is tell people, mm, I don't know why she's charging you 100. She only charged me 50. You don't want that out there. So I like to keep certain things confidential and within the contract and obligate the person I'm contracting with or obligate my client's client to keep those things confidential because it's in the best interest of my client. Not to mention if you have trade secrets or you have things that are in development, you want to be very, very careful with that. If you have a unique product or you have some things that could be detrimental to your company, if they got out, your competition might hear about it and go, oh, that's how she's doing it. All right, note to self, that's what we're going to start doing. This is how we're going to undercut her because we know what she charges and we know how she's going about it and we know what software she's using. So now we can we can come in and, and undercut the competition. So confidentiality is probably that number 10 that I would add in there. Um, any questions on that part of it, the whole contracts piece of it, the general overview of contracts? That was so good and so in-depth, you guys. Um, are you guys taking notes? You guys can unmute. Are you guys taking notes um, today? And are you guys um, going to make any changes in your current contracts based on what you're learning? I want you guys to talk back to me. Everyone is muted. <laughs> and I don't think I muted you guys all. Oh, yeah, everyone is muted. Mm-hmm. I don't think I did that. Are you guys able to unmute? Okay, Francis is able to. Okay, can you hear us, Francis? Okay, I'm not hearing her. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I can hear you now. 
Okay. okay. I'm taking that thought manual because I can, as I'm trying not to do several things. <laughs> but I work overnight, so normally this time I kind of get things settled down. But yes, I'm doing as best as I can. Okay. Um, are you going to make any changes to any contracts or agreements um, or um, implement anything that you heard today? Oh, we're not hearing you. Yeah, you're you're kind of going out. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So for me, um, the last time I probably had to do a contract because most of all my work I do on my own. Besides, if I reach out to a designer to print my affirmation cards, and normally there is a contract within that. But I can say in the beginning, I really didn't get anything in writing because what happens is I do use a third party service after um, my customers purchase something on my site, I go to their site and they actually build me. And sometimes I have to ask them to build me because they may not. And so or check with them to make sure they ship something out because they are a small mom and pop company. Um, and then, so I know changing the way or moving forward if I choose a company or another company, I'll make sure that I have in detail in writing the time frame that it really should take them to contact um, me is sending me a shipping, shipping information, create the cards, bill me, all that information. I'll make sure I have that in writing compared to just going with the flow of conversation. Because a lot of things, a lot of things did happen over the telephone and then by email of what, you know, what the steps were. I think that's a really, <clears throat> I think that's a really important um, point that that she brings up. A lot of um, the businesses, especially on fan base, are product businesses and they ship things out to consumers. So is there something that they should be putting in their disclosures or in, you know, in their language um, that binds the customer to, you know, some kind of agreement um, that protects them? Yeah, I mean, I think actually uh, Francis's comment brings up a couple of things that I, I'm, let me make note here. Um, uh, it, when you are shipping things, put it this way, you, what, if you can think of it, <laughs> put it in your contract. Meaning if you are shipping something and you want to set it up so that once it's shipped, then the person owes you, regardless of whether it's received or not, because you've delivered on your end of it. You don't work for the post office. You don't work for UPS. You don't work for X, Y, and Z. I'm not saying that's what you're going to do, but if that's how you want that structured, if that's your expectation, if you send it out and you don't get paid and you're like, wait a minute, you didn't pay me. And they go, well, you know, I didn't get it. And you're like, well, I still sent it and I can show you proof I sent it. If that's how you feel about that situation and you're willing to defend that position, make sure that's in writing. That goes I can't, to the I was going to say, I can't tell you, I can't tell you how many times, and this is, I don't, you know, I don't sell a product, um, but I do have employees and I can't tell you how many times the employees decide they don't want to come to the office to pick up their check and they say, drop it in the mail. And I tell them, if I drop it in the mail, you're going to get it when the post office delivers it. And they call a week later and they say, I didn't get my check. Can you cut me another check? I'll be happy to cut you another check, but you're going to have to pay a stop payment fee. But I never got my check. I don't have anything to do with that. Well, can you can you tell me where my check is? No, I don't work for the post office. <laughs> Right. So I don't I don't have a product, but I'm sure those of you that do have a product deal with that. You know, you don't, especially now with the way, you know, um, shipping has been going. I'm sure that you've dealt with, you know, customers saying I haven't gotten my product. You know, it's been you know, it's been two weeks and it was supposed to be here in five days. Um, I have, you know, I have employees all the time that will say that. You know, I didn't get it. And I say, I don't work for the post office. I don't, once it's, once I deliver it to USPS, it is no longer, you know, Trash Logic or Lanika E. Johnson's, you know, responsibility. I, I told you what your options are. So, you know, and from a customer service standpoint, you may not take that same tact, but, you know, <laughs> just so that you, you know, can keep in mind though, if there's something that you want to include, um, in your language, though, in your shipping language, that might be something to think about. Right. And to that point, if you are going to work with a template, as I mentioned before, and bring it to an attorney, that's a good place to brain dump. 
So no matter how wild your idea is, if you want to throw it into that document that you bring to an attorney to review for you, it's a good time to throw it in there because the attorney can tell you if that's legal or not. They can tell you if you can or cannot do that. But it's better for you to put it out there and say, this is what I want, right? This is my wish list of what I want to exchange with this customer or this client and let the, the attorney sort it through. I don't recommend that if you're doing it yourself and you're not gonna see an attorney, then you may wanna stick to whatever source you've Googled it on um, for your, your Google degree. But um, if you are gonna deal with an attorney, go ahead and throw that in because that only helps them to craft what you're looking to get out of it that much better. Um, Francis also brought up two other points that I wanted to make sure to address. Um, she talked about where you have a contract or you have an agreement, right? Or you started with an agreement and then a conversation takes place. I cannot tell you how many people get caught up with, yeah, but that's not what they said. And I'm like, yeah, but that's not going to help you. Can a court decide to go with the verbal part? They could. Are they likely to? No, because they don't want to do that. They don't want to get in the middle of your mess. They want it to be clean and neat. Again, they're going to refer back to that writing. And you can try to come in there with your honor, but that's not what they said. And then the opposing counsel, if it was me, would go, yeah, but what does it say, your honor? Um, so that's a risk you take if you want to rely on something someone has said to you um, and, and not force it to be in writing. But I, again, I always say, keep it in writing, put it in writing, no matter how small, even if they say this could happen, but in the paper, it says this will happen. Could and will do not mean the same thing. And it may be a small point, but the difference between could and will could be the difference between a valid contract and an invalid contract. So make sure you understand every piece of what you're signing, um, both in the giving and the receiving of a contract if you're going to be drafting it yourself. Um, the other point is it's okay to change as you grow, meaning if I do business with this particular person and I learn a really valuable skill, a really valuable lesson, like, oh, wow, I don't want to do that anymore. I can shift directions with my next contract, right? And that's important to do. I'll tell you, when I started out in immigration, I spent a lot of time not getting paid and I could not figure out why. And it was because I was basing my contracts on the service that I was going to provide to my client. And unfortunately, I was dealing with some clients in some really difficult places, right? So sometimes they wouldn't pay me right away or they wouldn't be able to pay me because of X, Y, and Z. You better believe it didn't take too many of those contracts before I was like, oh, Okay, pump the brakes. What we're going to do now, not because I'm a, a not a caring person. I do care about these people. I do want to see things work out for them. However, what I need to do if I want to eat and live and, and continue to grow my business is I now have to say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. This, the, the paperwork that I've drafted for you becomes your property when you finish paying me. So I've still done what I said I was going to do, but it doesn't become your property until you've paid me for it. Um, and so that's a lesson that I learned and it was a way that I shifted and pivoted. Um, okay. It looks like I see a hand up. Yes. Oh, Francis, Francis, did you put your hand up or were you waving? Yeah. Okay. Can you get closer to the microphone? I'm not sure. Yeah. We're not hearing you. I need to type it in the chat. Yeah, okay. if you try, type your question in the chat and then we'll answer it. Does okay. anyone else have a question for Natasha? Well, Francis is typing hers. Okay, and if not, this is the last point I'll make before I jump into partnership agreements because I know we have uh, a limited amount of time here is family and friends. We oh, Sheena that. has a question. Sheena oh, has okay. a question. Go, Go ahead, Sheena. Um, what is the difference between um, putting a clause in the contract versus a separate non-disclosure agreement? Um, it really just depends on what you're trying to achieve. And I'll be honest with you, it's stylistic in a lot of instances. You can have a concise non-disclosure agreement as a clause in a contract, right? I prefer most of the times to do it that way just because no one wants to have to deal with separate contracts, right? And, and a lot of times you've got to get, the more complicated you make it, the more difficult it is to uphold in some instances, right? 
Now you okay. can put in a clause that says that this addendum becomes part of this contract, but it's just a whole other layer when you could have probably summarized that in a paragraph. Don't get okay. me wrong, if the complexity of the, the matter requires a whole separate document, it, there may be cases where you need a whole separate document because you're dealing with patents and you're dealing with intricacies and there are a lot of parties and this needs to be clear that this is its own separate thing. Okay. For most contracts, a non-disclosure clause accomplishes the same thing with a whole lot less paper. Got it. I have a friend who like, she just recently came out with a, a product. I don't want to like give her personal business away, but when she would have discussions with us, we all had to have sign non-disclosure agreements. We didn't have a contract with her, but by right of us brainstorming with her, she did not want us to disclose this product that she was coming up with. So I just wonder like, what was the difference between just a separate one and, and including it in the contract? That's totally different though. I'm glad you clarified. That's a freestanding non-disclosure agreement. That's a separate contract in and of itself. And I understand okay. the reason for that, right? I deal with that all the time in cannabis. Right now, everything is such a secret and everything is so proprietary. There are people who will not sit in a room with you and have a conversation with you unless you've signed an NDA. And that's because they don't know yet if they're gonna contract with you. There may not be a reason to go into business together, but they wanna protect whatever is discussed in that room and in that time. So there are reasons to have a separate non-disclosure agreement. I was talking about the instance, sometimes you will find someone who will in the same sitting give you like this 10 page contract, this three page NDA and then, and you're just like, okay, that was too much. You went online, didn't you? You Googled it and then you just, <laughs> you know, everything you found. <laughs> like, Got there it. was no finesse to this at all, huh? So yeah. <laughs> That, that's two different um, um, situations, but yes. And that's not a bad idea. I can't tell you time, how many times I've been on fan base and I hear people give out these brilliant ideas and I'm like, don't do that. Because you can't, you can't say, well, that was my idea. You can't yeah. make claim to an idea. Once you've released it out into the world, you've released it out into the world. So if you've got this great idea that you haven't done anything with and I hear it and I go down tomorrow and I register my my um, web page name and I get my EIN and then I just beat you at your own game. So I tell people all the time, please be careful with your ideas um, mm -hmm. and do things like NDAs if you're if you're in a room with a trusted person and you want to share that information. Got it. Thank and you so guys, much. Utilize, um, if, you're, if you are doing this on Fanbase, utilize the private rooms. There yeah. are private rooms. You don't, if you want to have a conversation with somebody and you hear somebody say something and you really want to talk to them about it, say, hey, let's jump into a private room. That is an option on fan base. Yeah, so. definitely use those tools, but just be careful, especially with your ideas. I've heard too many good ones where I'm like, oh God, don't say that. Um, oh, uh, the last point I was gonna make was about family and friends and how much we really, 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 really love them. And sometimes they're our biggest, biggest, biggest nightmare, um, especially when it comes to contracts. A lot of times family and friends get very offended, right? They take it very personally. And for me, I keep it simple. I'm like, there, there is no personal in business. There isn't, there's no room for it. And I, don't, I just don't deal with it. I love my mother to death. I would lay down my life for my mother. When I started my cannabis company, I had my mother sign an NDA. I'd have my child sign an NDA. I would have my spouse sign an NDA because it's not an offense, it's a protection, right? Um, now, would I pursue my mom? Probably not. But it's a protection in that it emphasizes to the person, this needs to stay here. And it's serious. So um, don't be afraid to contract with family and friends. Don't get into business with anyone without a contract, period. It's not in your best interest to do so. And you will regret it at some point down the line. And yeah. that's, 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 that's facts. So um, you guys, this conversation has been so good. It's a lot like I just I like I always say that CEO school is so full of information um, and it is it's so full of information and it's information you can't just readily get right. This is information that you really would have to seek out and um, like this is a master class. This really is a master class. Um, I don't know if you guys can take any more, honestly. I just think it's just so much. I just don't know if you guys take any more. So I just sent Natasha a message and asked if we could do a part two um, <laughs> and do um, and do the rest. Hold on, my computer's doing crazy things today. Um, 
would you be willing to do a part two um, and then we'll dive into partnership agreements after everybody has, has had a chance to rest their brain and absorb this information? Um, would you would you be willing to do that? I absolutely would. I would absolutely okay. do that. Y'all just got a Howard Law degree. Y'all don't even you know sure it. Sure did. <laughs> we can definitely do a part two. And it's a perfect time to stop because that's where I um I finished off with the general contract information. Um, I do want to make sure I address Francis's question, which I see in here. Yes. So I will get to that, but we can definitely do a part two. Okay. So go ahead and answer Francis's question and then we'll schedule the time for the part two. It may be soon, y'all. It may be sooner than you think, but I do. I think I need a nap. And um, <laughs> this is a lot. I'm like, I was like, I don't know if I'll be able to fill two hours. <laughs> Yes. And I think I'm like, I need to rewrite all my contracts. I thought I had this stuff on life. Good Lord. Um, so yeah, let's answer Francis's, um, uh, she's not cannabis qu queen. Let's, let's get it straight. She is cannabis. She is cannabis. Um, so let's, uh, answer, uh, El Bagande, Francis El Bagande. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> So I believe Francis's question, and I'll read it, and I'll I'll kind of tell you what I think it's asking me. Um, for a contract, can you quote or include the details of the phone conversations via email um, for confirmation of the phone conversation? So I see this two different ways. The first way is you can't supplement a contract that's been signed, right? So I can't take a contract that we've made and then all of a sudden we had a conversation and I'm like, oh, let me shoot off an email and say, oh, by the way, just want to clarify that this is what you said and this is what you meant. You can't do that retroactively. It just won't have any, it doesn't have any bite. It has no legal standing. You could do it for the sake of customer relations, but five years down the line, when you go to court, you can't run in with your email printed out and go, but wait, your honor, what about this sheet? They'll be like, this sheet is not in the contract. And um, it's called the four corners of the document, even though you've got more than four corners. The four corners of the document is what is referred to as what's in the contract is what we go by. We're not going by anything else. So if you want to reference something else, that actually has to be in the contract. So you might see a contract that says, Exhibit A or attachment A or supplement A is part of this contract. That's the only way to do that. So if you have that conversation, right, prior to the execution of the contract, and remember the contract itself tells you how it is executed. For some contracts, it's executed once the signatures are received. For some contracts, it's executed once the funds are received. For some contracts, it's executed on a particular date. You want to have that spelled out in your contract. But as long as the contract hasn't been executed, right, the, meaning the contract's not live, then you could always say, oh, before we sign off on this, before this goes to execution, I want to make sure we add a, a clause here that refers back to the conversation we have. I've memorialized it in an email, and that email is now part of this contract. That's how you get that conversation into the contract. Um, along I wanna, with, real quick, I want to add to this. So this is not a legal thing, but just a, a tip. So I always tell my employees that I don't want, I don't want um, to hear about, I had a conversation with this person and this is what they agreed to. I always tell them whatever conversation you have with one of our clients, I need you to follow that up with an email. If you have a conversation with our client, I need you to send them an email and say, per our conversation, or we um, thank you for taking my call today, just to recap what we talked about. So now we can always go back to that email and usually they'll respond to that email. So if there is something wrong with what you said, they will respond in that email and clarify it. So that is just a tip doing business in general just make sure that you're always recapping things through email that you said verbally. So I'm sorry, that's that's not legal, but that's just good business. Well, you know, Lanika has her own law degree, apparently, because that's actually where I was going to go. I was about to say something very similar in that one thing I do encourage my clients to do is to document everything, especially when you're still in the negotiation phase, right? And especially if they are saying something to you verbally that is not what they said to you before or is not in the paperwork that you're looking at. I would always shoot off a quick email and say, 
you know, hey, just looking at this uh, contract that you shot over, what we discussed was slightly different. This is how I understood it. That documentation is important because that goes to intent. Even though I said a moment ago that the, the email doesn't necessarily become part of the contract until that, uh, unless it's referred to in the four corners of the document, there is an instance where that email is very pertinent, very relevant, because that goes to the intent. Because if you've given me this piece of paper, but you verbally told me something different, and I shot you an email saying, blah, 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 blah. This is how I understood it. And you respond to that and go, yep, that's what we talked about. Now I can take this piece of paper, ask for it to be entered into evidence, because I'm not trying to say that it is a supplement to the contract or it overrides the contract. What I'm trying to show is this is proof of intention. This is what I agreed to. And this is what they told me I was agreeing to. Right. So that's slightly different. But that's exactly what, what I was going to recommend is document everything. Document everything. And even if you've forgotten some of these rules and you didn't do it the right way, if you have a later conversation, just document it. It won't hurt to document it. I just wouldn't rely on that to change your contract, if that makes sense. Yep. That's some good info. That's some good info. So we are going to put a pin in it. Thank you so much, Natasha, for today. This was in incredible you really are a boss and i just i i'm so blessed to know you um we're all blessed to even know to even know that we have access to you i don't you know you guys if you're not subscribed to her on fan base you better make sure that you do um she is i know for a fact that she is working on some content that you guys are not going to be privy to if you are not subscribers and it is deep and it is um, useful and it is pertinent to business and you are going to need it it's necessary so make sure you're subscribed to her if you can on fan base and that you follow her she is canna boss on fan base um also um can you give uh your email address in case people want to email you directly i'm gonna type it in the chat okay and, and that's because it's a pain in the neck email, but you can always um, go to my uh, website directly, which is going to be www.theevergreensolutions, with an S at the end, .com. You can always contact me there, but I'm going to go ahead and put my uh, direct e email here as well. Anybody um, want to give any feedback or ask any questions while we're wrapping up here? I really appreciate you guys all coming today. This has been awesome. Is anybody's brain exploding? <laughs> Is anybody like, woo, like me? Like, goodness gracious. I mean, I have like two pages worth of notes here. It's just so, so much information. So you guys, it's in the, um, it's in the chat. It says, um, in Andrews at the evergreensolutions.com. Um, if you, if I have your email address, if you're a subscriber, I should have your email address. Uh, make sure you DM me if you've never sent it to me. And um, I will send out the replay every week. Um, and I also will send out the chat. So if you guys have not been getting the chat transcript, which is um, what Carla has been typing all the notes in, um, and also the replay of the video on YouTube, then uh, please send me an email and I will, or send me a DM with your email address and I will make sure you're added to the distribution list. I'm reading your notes. I, you're welcome, Sheena. Um, and you are welcome, Janine. I'm super excited for part two. Um, I don't know if Natasha answered me yet um, about part two. No, yes, 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 yes. I will do part two. I will do part did two. Did you see my text about oh. when? Oh, okay. I'll, I'll okay. look at when. I'll look at a when. Thank you guys okay. also for allowing me to do this. Thank you, Lanika, for having me here. I really, really do enjoy. I, I love kind of just sharing knowledge with people. It's, it's at the heart of a lot of what I do, even in the cannabis space. Like I mix it up and try to keep it fun and light and informative, yeah. but I really like sharing information with folks. So thank you. Bernetta had a question before we, before we go out. Um, uh, six to 10. Okay. Oh, there are 10, the 10, 10 things were the tips. The elements of the contract were actually just offer, acceptance, um, consideration, legality, and jurisdiction. 
So the six to 10 elements of the contract, you want to read those real quick. You don't have to go into them, just six read them. Six to 10 of the tips are, um, you want to clarify specific payment obligations. You want to agree to the circumstances that terminate the contract. Um, you want to agree on a way to resolve disputes. Uh, you want to pick a uh, governing state for your law, which is that jurisdiction piece. And you want to keep it confidential if it's relevant. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read each one um, again so that Carla can type it into the chat. Okay. Um, Carla, you you want to write type it into the chat. Okay. So um, the 10 tips are number one, get it in writing. Two, keep it simple. And you can correct me if I'm saying these wrong. <laughs> two, two is keep it simple. Three um, is make sure you're dealing with the right person, which is different than number four. You want to identify the correct party. So first one is the person, right? So Natasha or Lanika. Number four is the correct party. Is it um, is it Costco Inc. or is it just Costco, right? Right. So identify the right party. So number five is specify payment obligations. Five is uh, spell out the details. I'll spell out the details. Okay. Mm -hmm. Six. Is what you just said. Oh, six is clarified payment. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then seven is um, your exit strategies. How did you say that? I... Exit strategies work. Okay. okay. <laughs> what to Eight. do if you want to get out of that contract? Okay. What do you want to do to get out? Eight is agree on a way to settle. Um, nine is... Um, Pick your, I can't even read my own writing. Uh, wait a minute. How, how, how fast you think I can type? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm like, uh, uh, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, I'm good, but not that good. <laughs> so agreeing, uh, eight is agreeing to how you want to resolve disputes. Oh, I thought, oh yeah, okay. Eight is agreeing on a way to, okay. Settle disputes, so arbitration or not, right? That was that. And then nine was um, pick uh, a state, right? Mm -hmm. Pick mm -hmm. what state you're going to. And then number 10, uh, confidentiality. Yep. So those are the 10. So this, you guys, this transcript, um, I turn into, I, thank you, Carla. Thank you, girl. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this chat, you guys, I turn it every week into a PDF. And I upload it onto ceoschool.live onto the transcript section. So you guys can go on and you can read the transcript um, at the end. Um, and I usually buy Monday. For some reason, my software is taking a long time to export the video. So it's been taking me a few days to get it up. So by Monday, usually um, I'll have the video and the transcript up um, for you guys to read, um, to read through and to view the uh the recap of the video so i want to again thank everybody um to my subscribers i also want to thank you for joining us here at ceo school and if this is your first ceo school and you're one of my subscribers absolutely come i come to ceo school i love being here i love the guests that lanika has the knowledge that's shared i just think it's a really great positive space on fan base so do join do subscribe, do become a part. My subscribers will get some additional tips and things that I'll be drafting out for them, some stuff that I've created uh, for them on that site, um, as well as some uh, information on business formation. That's just something that I'm gonna give you guys as a as a thank you for joining us here, but. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Woo, woo, woo. All right, y'all, CEO school is a wrap. It's a wrap. Another Friday down next week.